It's one of the most used materials on Earth. It has been instrumental throughout history, shaping our civilization and the way we live today. Marble is the natural stone behind many of Earth's historic marvels, masterpieces, and everyday use. Today, Marble.com will explore this amazing material from formation to application in one of New York's most prestigious institutions, the New York Public Library. By the second half of the 19th century, New York had already surpassed Paris in population and was quickly catching up with London, which at the time was the world's most populous city. If we think back to that time period, there were no cell phones and no computers. So libraries were a vital hub for entertainment and information. In order for New York, now a thriving metropolis, to become the world's greatest center of urban culture, it must then have a prodigious library. New York already had two libraries, the Astor and Lenox, but neither were truly public institutions. Upon his death, a prominent one-time governor, Samuel J. Tilden, bequeathed the bulk of his fortune, about $2.4 million, to establish and maintain a free public library. By 1892, both the Astor and Lenox libraries were experiencing financial difficulties, and a plan was set forth to combine the two libraries in Tilden's trust to form the New York Public Library. In the early 20th century, New York's population was growing so rapidly that the great city was going to quickly outgrow its current water resource, the Croton Reservoir. The Croton Reservoir occupied a two-block section of Fifth Avenue between 40th and 42nd Streets and seemed to be a perfect location for the new public library. Before construction could begin, the reservoir would need to be removed. Over 500 workers had to spend two years dismantling the reservoir and preparing the site. Work on the library progressed slowly and steadily over 16 years and cost $9 million to complete. Marble is a metamorphic rock that is formed naturally from limestone within the Earth's crust. Limestone is formed when the skeletal remains of ocean-dwelling organisms settle on the ocean floor and are compacted by waves over the course of millions of years. As even more time progresses, these areas of the Earth's crust will shift and converge upon each other. The resulting heat and pressure transforms the limestone into marble. Man has used marble for centuries and for a variety of purposes. Due to its beautiful appearance and sturdy nature, marble has been a favorite for artists and architects over the course of history. The first recorded uses of marble occurred in ancient Egypt and Mesopotamia thousands of years ago. Since the marble was heavy and dense, these civilizations used it for the building of columns and support structures. Centuries later, marble became popular in ancient Greece and Rome. These cultures used marble for more elaborate and artistic purposes, such as buildings of great significance and works of art. In the 6th century BC, the first all-marble building was erected in Greece, the Athenian treasury. The use of marble by the Greeks for such masterpieces made the stone popular for many centuries to come. Sculptors in ancient Greece loved to use this stone because of its luminous appearance, which made statues of the human figure appear very lifelike. The word marble, in fact, comes from the Greek marmaros, which means shining stone. After the Greeks, marble was continually used by a variety of Western civilizations. From the ancient Roman Empire to the Middle Ages, the Renaissance era, and all the way up to the modern era. Renowned artists such as Michelangelo were greatly inspired by this stone material. He was once quoted as saying, every block of stone has a statue inside it, and it is the task of the sculptor to discover it. Michelangelo was able to produce one of his most memorable works, the statue of David, out of an enormous block of marble. In modern times, marble's popularity has spread around the world. It continues to be used for sculptures, buildings, and works of art, as well as home fixtures and decor, such as countertops and vanity tops. Let's try a brain teaser. How many visitors did the New York Public Library have on opening day in 1911? Was it 50, 500, 5,000, or 50,000? Did you guess 50,000? If you did, then you were correct. The marble used for the New York Public Library is quarried from Danby, Vermont. This is the Danby quarry 
where the uh, Vermont Denby white marble is quarried. The block behind me is a nice Olympian white block. This quarry is uh, 150 years old and the marble is 600 million years old. This quarry is the largest underground marble quarry in the world. A geological survey is taken to determine where the areas best suited for quarrying are and which areas can be used as structural support. Besides the Denby marble uh, that we produce entirely inside of the Denby quarry, we also handle uh, uh, two other stones. We have the Colorado and the Grey Limestone. Once an area has been found suitable for extracting marble, a specialized chainsaw begins to cut. At a speed of 5 centimeters per minute, a 2 meter long diamond segmented blade begins to cut into the stone. The blade itself can cut in both horizontal and vertical positions, and after several hours, the top, bottom, left and right sides of the stone block are cut. Now that each side of the stone has been cut, a diamond wire saw will be used to cut the back side of the stone, essentially cutting the last part of the block out from the mountain. This diamond wire saw utilizes a series of pulleys and can be used for cutting from multiple angles. In some instances, a block of stone may not be perfectly square or may have imperfections. In order to remedy this, a trim saw is used to cut the block into a more manageable shape. At this point, depending on its final use, the block can be put into inventory, shipped to a fabricator, or processed further into slabs. A block is brought to a gang saw to be cut into slabs. This block is placed onto a table, which is pushed upward into a group of 80 blades, each moving back and forth in unison, essentially cutting the singular block into several slabs of even thickness. So we are inside uh, the factory of the Denby Quarry. More precisely, this is where we finish all the slabs. Slabs waiting to be polished are moved individually onto the polishing machine. A series of 4 to 16 polishing heads with varying grit will polish the surface of the stone. The level of polish desired will determine how many polishing heads wind up getting used. The Vermont Quarry can polish up to 100 slabs per day. After the slabs are polished, they are stored in the company inventory or shipped to the fabricator or warehouse. Building and sculpting with stone are two of the original forms of art and architecture, and the construction of the library was a monumental task considering the era in which that construction took place. Working and sculpting stone is an involved process, often taken for granted. Stone is very much a challenge. It's, it's heavy, it's fragile, it's expensive. Um, it's not really what you'd say, or what you'd call is the cutting edge of contemporary art. Uh, I think stone carvers are considered somewhat old fashioned these days. Back in the day, before power tools and electricity, the way they would have been working the stone for the library in New York would have been entirely by hand. Uh, they would have used hammers, chisels, some pointed, some with teeth, some, uh, this is a flat chisel that's used for, for roughing out pieces of stone like this. If you have a sharp edge like this, they take this flat chisel and go like this and that would knock the stone right off. So by hand, actually, uh, if you know what you're doing, you can move a lot of material pretty quickly. And those guys, probably a lot of them were European, uh, they really knew how to move stone. This is called a point chisel. When, as you're roughing out a shape, they would have used these points before they got into actually fine carving the points. Same thing like the flat chisel. All handwork. An accomplished sculptor must spend years as an apprentice. Once the rough chiseling is done, the really tedious stage of the work begins. The finishing process for marble generally involves uh, files. Initially, once it's been carved down to surface, they would go in with steel rasps and actually file and shape the stone. And as you can see, this is not a quick process, but the only way to get those subtle contours and 
perfectly shaped surfaces is by very gradually shaping them, wearing them down to their surface. From quarrying the stone to the actual selection of each individual piece, working marble is a huge challenge. And those guys would have made models uh, out of clay and plaster and then worked on transferring the model to the stone. We had to do a lot of repeat forms, all uh, the column, acanthus leaves, all those sh shapes that they were carving had to be done in repetition, so they would use models and then do a very direct process. The marble on the library building is Vermont marble and about three feet thick. The building is constructed of approximately 530,000 cubic feet of marble. Uh, to put that into comparison, the New York Stock Exchange only contains about 50,000 feet. So you can see the difference in the scale. The two famous stone lions at the entrance of the library are made of Tennessee marble and lie at both sides of the stairway entrance, much like a bookend. Their original names, Leo Astor and Leo Lennox, in honor of the library's founders, were changed into Lord Astor and Lady Lennox, although both lions are male. In 1930, the Lions were nicknamed Patience and Fortitude by Mayor LaGuardia, who chose those names because he felt that the citizens of New York would need to possess these qualities in order to see them through the Great Depression. The marble staircases that are in this hallway, Astor Hall, exist without any brick or metal work, so they are self-supporting. It's uh, also of note the vaulted ceiling, which supports not only itself, but the floor above it. The architects Carrera and Hastings chose white marble for the material of the building. The white marble came from two quarries in Dorset, Vermont, and as it came down, they ended up rejecting about 65% of the marble because it didn't meet their high quality standards. The marble, however, was not bad. It ended up going into use into other buildings, and one of those buildings is the Harvard School of Medicine. 